It's great to see you all virtually at this lovely workshop. Uh, I'm delighted to be talking about the time evolution of cosmological correlators, namely the problem of how the initial state of the universe, the beginning of inflation, evolves under the action of some Hamiltonian uh, to produce the correlated fluctuations that we see in the CMB and large scale structure. So rather than specifying some explicit inflationary model, our goal here is to assume only very basic properties about this interaction Hamiltonian, uh, like space-time symmetries that it might have, that it's unitary and that it's local. So as Daniel mentioned, there's a number of us have been working on very similar lines. And, uh, and I think as a community, we've made really remarkable progress in the last few years. Now, I won't have time to do justice to all of the exciting developments. Daniel had a really lovely list. Um, so instead, I'm going to just cherry pick some of the, the main results from, from this paper, which I wrote last year with Sebastian Cespedes and Anne Davis. Great. So let me start by saying how I view the early universe. It's a period of approximately the sitter expansion uh, during which correlated fluctuations of some scalar field phi are produced. So you probably don't need much convincing that this is an interesting phase of the universe's history to study. Um, the three reasons that came to my mind first were that this is a very high energy environment compared to terrestrial colliders. So that's a place where we might learn about very fundamental physics. Uh, it's also a, a kind of new conceptual arena where we can really test how well we understand quantum field theory on curved space time. Uh, and then finally, you might hope that if you went back far enough in time, you might learn something interesting about quantum gravity. Ultimately, whatever your take on this is, the early universe is an important window into new physics. So in particular, what I want to do is study the time evolution of the state from the beginning of inflation to the end of inflation. And given that we only have direct access to this state at the end of inflation, at the boundary, you might ask, why am I going to talk to you for half an hour about uh, how the, the time evolution in the bulk looks like? So, so again, there's a few answers that I could give to this question, and they're mostly pragmatic. Um, so firstly, there are some properties of the inflationary dynamics, which are just much easier to see by looking at how the state evolves in time. So, um, so a good example is unitarity, which is all about how probabilities are conserved in time. And if you restrict your attention to, to the boundary, it's then much harder to see uh, what the imprint of that, that time evolution is. Good. The second thing is, is that uh, if there were some, you know, the sitter holographic prescription for reconstructing all of the bulk and all of the inflationary dynamics just from our boundary observables, that would be super. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, I don't know how to do that. All I know how to do is solve the Schrodinger equation. So that's kind of a sensible place to start. Uh, and then finally, this was mentioned in the discussion on Monday, actually, that uh, the late universe is also approximately de Sitter when it's dark energy dominated. Um, but there we don't have access to the, the boundary and the asymptotic future. We only measure what's going on at finite times as the universe evolves. And so you might hope that also some of the results here might be importable to uh, dark energy in the late universe. Good. So exactly what I want to achieve is I'm going to study this wave function, which describes the state of the universe at some conformal time eta during inflation. And I'm going to suppose that the explicit Hamiltonian is not known, except for three very general features, namely space-time symmetry, unitarity, and locality. And the question, the big question that we want to answer is, how does this constrain the, the wave function? Good, so I, I should stress that the advantage of trying to do things this way is that it's a very model independent approach, right? The kinds of constraints that we'll derive ideally then apply to any model of inflation, pick your favorite model, as long as it's you know, symmetric, unitary, and local, these are very mild assumptions to be making. Uh, it's also inspired, as, as Daniel was mentioning, by the fabulous progress that we've made in scattering amplitudes. So these three features, uh, it's, it's no accident that I picked those. Um, for instance, we know very well that on flat space, the uh, scattering amplitudes, these S matrix elements, are very tightly constrained by the space-time isometries, Lorentz invariants, by unitarity and by locality. 
And so another way to think about what we're trying to achieve, the big picture goal, is to somehow import a lot of that success that's been enjoyed for flat space scattering amplitudes and import that to the correlators that are relevant for cosmology. Good. So my final kind of introductory slide is just to set up the, the notation for, for people that maybe haven't done calculations in the Schrodinger picture before. The way we represent the state of the universe at conformal time eta is we write it as e to the i times some phase. And this phase is a functional of just a, a real scalar field phi. Okay, so that's the, the first kind of technical assumption I'm going to make is I'm just going to focus on what the scalar field does. Now in practice, we can take this, this phase, this functional, and we can expand it in powers of phi. Um, so there's something phi squared, there's some coefficient C2, phi cubed has a coefficient C3, and so on. And these coefficients are called wave function coefficients, and really those are the objects we're going to be studying. Okay. Good. Now to make the formula more readable, I'm going to suppress all of the labels that I possibly can. So in practice, these three fields, for instance, are labeled by three momenta, K1, K2, K3, uh, and so really when you see something like the integral of C3 phi cubed, uh, this is really an integral over the three momenta that label the fields. And then this wave function coefficient depends not only on the, the time slice that the state lives on, but it also depends on the three momenta. Good. So it's the time evolution of these things we're going to study because they uniquely specify a state for you. And uh, physically, C2 is the thing that you would need to compute the power spectrum, how correlated pairs of points are in the CMB. C3 is the thing that you would need to compute the I spectrum. C4 is the thing you would need to compute the tri spectrum, etc. Good. Perfect. So that's kind of the kinematics, how we describe the state, time eta. Now, how does it evolve in time? The dynamics are given by the Schrodinger equation, okay, which can be written very simply as the uh, first order differential equation, the phase changes with time according to the on-shell Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian where I've integrated out the momenta in terms of phi. Cool. So important technical assumption number two is that I'm going to work at weak coupling throughout the talk. So everything I say is uh, some kind of tree level statement where I'm ignoring the loops that appear in the Schrodinger equation. And, uh, and what this means is that I'm really picking this C2, the quadratic wave function coefficient, and I'm saying that it's much larger than all the other ones. And what that means is that if you think of the state as a probability distribution for phi, it's kind of approximately Gaussian with some width set by C2. And then the other higher order wave function coefficients are just small perturbations on top. Cool. And then the only other thing you need to know is that we're going to be working in what's called the interaction picture, which is that we split the Hamiltonian up into two pieces. There's a free part, which is just a canonical scalar field. And there's the interactions. These are the things which we don't know, but we're going to assume are symmetric, unitary, and local. And now if you were to write the Schrodinger equation as an equation of motion for these wave function coefficients, you would find that, I mean, diagrammatically, it's very simple. The rate of change of, say, C4 is given, you sum over all the ways you can glue a C2 and a C4 together, and you sum over all the ways you can glue two C3s together, and then you also add any bulk interactions which act as a source for C4. Okay, so this is uh, schematically what the Schrodinger equation actually looks like. Now, this first term uh, is a bit funny because it's not really an interaction as such. This is more, the C2 insertion is kind of to do with the propagation of a particle through the space-time. And so what we can do is use our knowledge of the free theory. Okay, we can use the free theory mode functions to define a new field basis, phi hat, which is related to the old one by just multiplying by a factor of the mode function. Uh, and so similarly, the wave function coefficients with hats are just the old wave function coefficients with the appropriate factors of the mode function. And what that achieves is it removes this term here, right? It simplifies the propagation of all of the lines in the Feynman diagrams. Okay, so, so really what we're gonna be working with are Schrodinger equations that look like this, where the rate of change of C4 with a hat is all the ways you can glue two C3 hats together and, and then any bulk interactions that are sourcing C4. Okay, good. So now we're all on the same page, notationally and conceptually. The key things to take away are that I'm only talking about a real scalar field. Uh, I maybe mention spin at the end. Uh, I'm working at weak coupling, so I'm not talking about loops, only tree level stuff. Uh, and I'm assuming that we can completely solve the free theory, so we know what the free mode functions are, 
And all that information about the free propagation is just encoded in the hats. I've rescaled everything by free propagation to make my life easier. Cool. Uh, so then let me close the introduction by, by reminding you that even for very simple interactions, uh, things like lambda phi to the four, these wave function coefficients can be very complicated. In general, they're not analytic functions of the momenta or of the conformal times. They have poles, they have branch cuts. And so any constraints that we can come up with on the functional form of these things uh, would be very useful. Cool. So the roadmap, the plan for the rest of my time today is, uh, is, is the following. We're going to first talk about space-time symmetry, then unitarity, then locality, and what that means for the state as it evolves during inflation. So for space-time symmetry, we just heard a lovely talk about the cosmological bootstrap from Daniel. And so in, in one slide, I'm going to quickly summarize a lot of the amazing results that he just told us about. Um, the idea is that if you have a space-time, which is exactly the sitter, then in the bulk at some finite conformal time, there's these the sitter isometries. But when you go to the boundary at e to equals zero, they become much simpler. They become just the conformal word identities. And so the final state at the end of inflation is very tightly constrained by conformal symmetry as a result of the de Sitter invariance that the theory enjoys. Now, of course, Daniel also mentioned that it's not just the symmetry. There's also uh, a very important role that the singularity structure plays. Um, and we'll come to that later. First, I just want to talk about the, what the symmetries do for you. So the symmetries tell you that the wave function coefficients when eta is zero, um, transform in a, in a very particular way. So they essentially transform like endpoint correlation functions in some conformal field theory. And, uh, and this is something which was solved in uh, this paper here at the end of 2018 um, in, in a number of examples. One example I'm going to use just to, to kind of exemplify what's going on is a conformally coupled scalar field with this particular mass. Uh, and you can write the quartic wave function coefficient uh, in the following way. There's a kind of fixed momentum dependence, and then two constant coefficients. And then you could keep going. There's a systematic way to generate all of the allowed momentum dependences. And as you go to higher and higher orders, you would just find more and more constant coefficients. Okay, So this is very analogous to what would happen on flat space if you were looking at a scattering amplitude. You might have thought that the four particle scattering amplitude depends on four momenta. But you know that if it's really a, a Lorentz invariant process, the only kinematically allowed combinations of these momenta are the Mandelstam variables s and t. So you can expand the amplitude in terms of some constant coefficients times the allowed kinematic structures. Great. So the first question that we really want to answer is, uh, can this you know, powerful symmetry also be used in the bulk? Okay, so when I say bulk, I really mean some eta, which is not 0. And when I say boundary, I mean eta is 0. Good. So in the bulk, the symmetries that the sitter spacetime has, it's not simply the conformal group anymore. Right now, this is my attempt to draw a cartoon of what the dilations and the sitter boosts look like. Dilations uh, take a time slice and they advance it forwards in time and stretch it. And uh, boosts basically tilt your, your time slice. Now, there's a, a well-defined procedure for starting from some, some classical symmetry generators and turning them into noither charges, which you can then quantize by putting hats on everything. And so you promote phi and the conjugate momentum to operators. And then these give you operators you can use in the quantum theory to work out how a state would transform under these symmetries. Okay, good. So, um, so we started by writing down what the word identities are for these wave function coefficients. And for instance, the dilation word identity, so how the wave function coefficient in the bulk transforms under a dilation. Um, you can split it into two pieces. There's a, a piece which looks like a free theory dilation. And there's a piece which is, which is due to the interactions that you have. Okay. Similarly, the boosts uh, has exactly the same structure. There's some free theory piece, which just looks very much like a, a, a boost. And then you have an extra piece, which comes from the fact that there are interactions in the bulk. Good. Now, the dependence on the interaction Hamiltonian you maybe could have anticipated already from these pictures, because when you do a dilation or you do a boost, you're, you're changing your time slice. And so what you're doing is you're relating the state on one time slice to the state on another time slice. Uh, and by the Schrodinger equation, you would expect those are related by the interaction Hamiltonian. 
So there's kind of three things to take away from, from these word identities. If I give you some state in the bulk at finite eta, and I ask, is the state invariant under the decider isometries? First thing you should learn is that you cannot answer this question without specifying the interaction Hamiltonian in general. The exception is when you look at this very special place, eta is zero. The reason is that this particular time slice here, the boundary, is actually preserved by dilations and boosts. So all of the, the sitter observers, no matter how they put down coordinates, they all agree that there's this boundary eta equals zero. The final thing is if you were to pursue a cosmological bootstrap at finite eta, the fact that the interaction Hamiltonian appears explicitly means that you're going to get word identities that mix correlators of the field phi with correlators that also contain conjugate momenta. So if you go to very small eta, you can basically ignore the right-hand side, say, of the boost word identity, and you get something which is a, a simple equation just on the phi correlator, which you can then try and solve. But at a finite eta, you'll have to solve some coupled set of differential equations to find all of the phi correlators and also all of the phi pi mixed correlators as well. So that would be very interesting to think about in the, in the future. But let me come back to, to our goal, which was if you say nothing about the interaction Hamiltonian, how far can you get? And so what we've seen here is that space-time symmetries are only really useful at the boundary when eta is zero. And for example, they fix the momentum dependence, say, of C4, like this. If we want to do better, if we want to learn something about what's going on in the bulk, then we'll need to turn to our next ingredient, unitarity. And so what unitarity buys you is a number of conserved quantities, constants of motion. And it's intuitively, you can see why this might be the case. If I have unitary dynamics, i.e. a Hermitian Hamiltonian, what that guarantees is that the total probability is conserved. Okay. So the question is, how does the conservation of total probability, how would I write that as a constraint on these wave function coefficients? How would that constrain the bias spectrum, the tri spectrum, et cetera? So the way to answer this question is to start from the Schrodinger equation, okay, which say for the, the coefficient that determines the bias spectrum, it just looks like this. Now, if I were to take the dagger of both sides, I get some you know, dagger conjugate Schrodinger equation. Uh, and then if I take the difference of these two, I'll find something that looks very much like a conservation equation. Right? I'll find that the time derivative of C3 minus C3 daggered is proportional to the difference between H and H dagger. So even if I don't know what the interactions are explicitly, i.e. I don't know how to solve this equation, I do know how to solve this equation once I impose unitarity. Once I impose unitarity, this equation is very simple. It just says that C3 minus C3 dagger doesn't change with time. So I have some quantity that's conserved throughout the evolution. Good. Perfect. Now there is one catch to this, which should maybe make you a little bit suspicious. And that's that I haven't really told you what the dagger is. I've just happily put daggers on everything. And in order to make use of, of this identity, we really need to know what I mean by C3 with a dagger. Okay. So the subtlety here is that this interaction Hamiltonian is, uh, is really the on-shell Hamiltonian, where I've integrated out the momenta. So I've fixed the momenta in terms of phi and, and C2 and the other wave function coefficients. So when I write H dagger, the on-shell H dagger, really what I mean is I'm taking the Hamiltonian, I'm putting daggers on the operators, and I'm also taking an overall star. And so you might think, well, this equation here, the conjugated Schrodinger equation, surely I just take stars of both sides, but that's sadly not quite enough. Because if I just take a star of the Schrodinger equation, I'll just have a, a complex conjugation of the interaction Hamiltonian, and this is not equivalent to H with a dagger. Good. So the solution is to interpret this dagger as not just doing a complex conjugation, but also doing something clever with the momentum Namely, we're going to analytically continue all the momenta from k's to some k with a bar. And the analytic continuation is designed to achieve flipping all the phi's with phi daggers and all the pi's with pi daggers. Okay. So if we do this, if we take a star and we also flip all the k's to k bars, 
then indeed we find that this is the dual Schrodinger equation that we're after. So when I write an equation like this, I say that C3 minus C3 bar is a con constant. What I mean by the C3 uh, with a dagger is that I should take a complex conjugation and then replace all the mementos with K bars. Okay. Good. Now, maybe in an effort to make that less cryptic, really what we've done is we've found some other object, right? The C3 star with the K bars. And this other object is the thing which would evolve in time in the same way as the original wave function coefficient, but with all of the couplings complex conjugated, right? And this ensures that when I take the difference of these two, I'll find something that's proportional to the imaginary part of all of the Hamiltonian couplings and those, those vanish in a unitary theory. Uh, so then the final part of the story, you might say, well, okay, Scott, that, that's all very well, but then it seems very important that you know what the K bars actually are. Uh, because all this sounds a bit formal. And in simple examples, it's not difficult to work out what the k-bar needs to be. So for a real scalar field, say on FLRW, uh, if the scalar field is real in position space, then it means that in momentum space, it has the, this property. If I take the bar, it's the same as flipping the sign of the momenta. So that, that guarantees this first one. Uh, now the second one is a bit more fiddly. But if I have mode functions on FLRW, explicit mode functions, which I know they're Hankel functions, and they have the property that if I flip the sign of the magnitude of K, then that's the same as taking a star. Okay, so this analytic continuation is really taking Ks and it's flipping their sign spatially, and it's also flipping the sign of any moduli that you find. So this is a story for, for say the Bayes spectrum. You might ask, well, does this work for C4 and higher order wave function coefficients? And indeed it does. Uh, the only complication is that for say the tri-spectrum C4, the uh, Schrodinger equation now has not just this interaction term, it also has this- we Travel through term. the fabric of the physical world from black holes. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. I think that maybe your microphone has uh, become unmuted. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Um, Yes, so if you want to do the same story for the tri-spectrum, uh, you have to deal with this exchange term. And this is just an algebraic exercise. You can take this equation and this equation with daggers everywhere, and then you can rearrange it into the form of a conservation equation so that something is conserved as a result of unitarity. And that something is C4 minus C4 dagger, where again, the dagger just means take a star and then replace all the Ks with K bars. And then there's a piece which is quadratic in C3. Okay. Good, and so ultimately you arrive at, again, another conserved quantity, this time at fourth order in phi. And this is a program that you could carry out uh, until you're, you're blue in the face. Uh, at every order, you can construct some conserved quantity, which starts Cn minus Cn dagger, and then you add appropriate powers of the lower endpoint functions so that when you uh, take the time derivative, you're left with only hnt minus hnt dagger. Cool. And here I want to make very clear that this is, is very closely connected to the, this cosmological optical theorem, which Daniel mentioned, and which also appeared in this really lovely paper, also last year, about a week before this one. Um, and, then, and the cosmological optical theorem in this paper, the way that they prove it is not through fiddling with Schrodinger equations, but fiddling with uh, propagators, bulk to bulk and bulk to boundary propagators. And, uh, and really what they show is that if you assume a, a bunch Davies state initially, so you set all of the wave function coefficients to zero initially, then they show that at late times, all of these Js vanish. Okay, good. Which is of course completely consistent with, with, what, with what we're showing here. And that's that these Js, if you start in some arbitrary initial state, you can compute what they are initially. And then at late times, they haven't changed. So what that lets you do is connect the past and the future. Namely, we've seen that if you go to the conformal boundary in the future, the space-time symmetries are very constraining and they can say fix the momentum dependence of the quartic wave function coefficient in terms of some constants. And what unitarity tells you is something about what these constants have to be. Okay, so unitarity tells you that if you compute this J4, which in this case, it would just be the same thing but with real parts, in front of all the Cs. Unitarity says this has to be equal to whatever J4 was in the initial state. 
So to give a concrete example, if it really was Bunch Davies in the asymptotic past, then unitarity is telling you that the real part of all these coefficients uh, has to vanish. Okay, so unitarity is really fixing for you half of the undetermined coefficients, which would have appeared if you used symmetry alone. Super. So that's what unitarity buys you, these conserved quantities. It's a new way to connect the initial state to the final state uh, for any unitary evolution in between. And for instance, if it's bunch Davies in the past, it sets the real part of these coefficients to zero. Perfect. So then the final thing I want to tell you about is locality in the, in the few minutes that I, have, that I have remaining. So what locality buys you is that the interaction Hamiltonian, because we're just talking about a single real scalar, it must be analytic in the momentum. Okay? And the reason for this is that in position space, if all the interactions are point-like, uh, you have just functions of delta functions and derivatives of delta functions. And then when you go to momentum space, you get functions that are just uh, analytic combinations of pi dot pj. So you might think that's great. We have uh, now quite a, a strong constraint on the interaction Hamiltonian, namely that it's an analytic function. Mathematically, that's quite constraining. But the, the catch is that although the interactions might be analytic, the states themselves are often not. So in the example that, that we were just thinking about, the conformally coupled scalar near the boundary, this uh, boundary value of C4, say, has uh, poles, it has branch cuts. And so if I think about uh, going you know, backwards in time into the bulk a little bit, it doesn't really matter how analytic these interactions are, my bulk states are also going to be incredibly messy non-analytic functions that have poles and branch cuts in K. So at some level, the question we want to answer here is, suppose that we know or we were able to measure not just the boundary state, but also the state at some earlier time eta, how could we tell whether they were separated by local interactions? And the way to answer this question is to define something which we call a transfer function. And, uh, and the idea is quite simple. You, you take your time slice at e t equals zero and you imagine pushing it a little bit into the bulk. And now a number of things could happen. It could be that you started with no correlations on the boundary. And then as you move into the bulk, some interaction in your Hamiltonian has created, say, a, a triplet of correlated modes so that your bulk state now has a, a three-point correlation function. Uh, and we represent this as a T03. It's like you've transitioned from a state with no correlations to one with a three-point correlation. Another thing which could happen is you could start with a pair of modes that were correlated on the boundary. And as you push into the bulk, the interaction splits one of them into two. So you still end up with a, a three-point correlation at the end, but you started with a two-point correlation. So we've got T23. Uh, and, and so on. So, so it turns out there's only three other things which could happen. And that's that you start with two pairs of correlated modes. And then as you go into the bulk, they join together like this. Um, you could also start with three pairs of correlated modes. Um, and then finally, there's the really boring one, which is that nothing happens. You start with three correlated modes and you go into the bulk and they're still correlated at an earlier time. Good. Now, why these objects are useful is that you can make locality really manifest by writing the wave function coefficients in the bulk in terms of these transfer functions. Okay, so what you're really doing is you're trying to factorize any initial non-analyticity that was present at the boundary, and you're trying to factor that out from the analyticity that the interactions enjoy. So these t's depend on suitable derivatives of the interaction Hamiltonian, and they are analytic functions of the momenta. So that's why they're light blue. Uh, and then the boundary c outs, uh, they're, they're in principle incredibly non-analytic complicated things. Perfect. So how would you tell if the interactions are local or not? Well, you would write the bulk state in this way. You would read off the t's, and you would check whether the t's are analytic functions of momenta or not. If they are analytic, then your interactions can be local. If they're not analytic, then the interactions have some non-locality in them. The one caveat to this is that here I'm really talking about going a little bit into the bulk. If you go so far into the bulk that you, you cross the horizon, so you, you, you have modes whose momenta become comparable to the Hubble rate, um, then actually this argument breaks down because if you have 
an interaction Hamiltonian, that's say phi cubed plus two derivatives phi cubed, et cetera. This would correspond to, to these transfer functions being like a one plus eta squared k squared plus eta four k to the four, et cetera. And so when k eta becomes of order one, right, when this condition's met, then what's happening is a, an infinite number of these terms are becoming important. I really have to resum them. And that resummation can introduce new non-analyticities that weren't in the original Hamiltonian, but are appearing nonetheless in the wave function. Now, so why is this useful? Well, this is incredibly useful because if we start at the boundary where the symmetry has been enough to completely fix the momentum dependence of the wave function coefficients. Okay, so we saw before this uh, C4 can be written like this in terms of coefficient C1 and C2. Um, the, the, the quadratic wave function coefficient C2 is even simpler. It's just K to some particular power that depends on the mass. Right, so this is fixed by symmetry. What locality is giving you is a way to extend this into the bulk using, again, only a, a number of constant coefficients. So the way this would look explicitly, and this is the biggest equation that I'm going to show you today. So to make it more compact, let me define a dimensionless variable from the C2s by just multiplying it by the appropriate power of eta. Now, if I focus on the C4 and its contact contributions, I find that C4 in the bulk, it can be written as whatever it was on the boundary, and then plus this curly bracket here, which is a number of these analytic transfer functions multiplied by the non-analytic C2. Okay, so again, we've been able to pull apart stuff which is analytic because the interactions are local and stuff which is non-analytic because my boundary state is non-analytic. Good. So what that's achieved is that now we have a description of the state in the bulk uh, where we know it's momentum dependence. Okay, so the momentum dependence is kind of completely fixed. The only thing that isn't fixed is these constant coefficients, namely the, the constant coefficients that describe the boundary state and also the constant coefficients that describe these transfer functions. Okay. Perfect, good. So I'll make one final kind of technical remark about this. Uh, you, you might be kind of quickly counting that there's five of these transfer functions. And here I've expanded them just to say order k squared. It seems like I've introduced 10 new constant coefficients, which would be quite a lot. Let me make the point that if you work a bit harder, these coefficients are actually all related to each other. Only two of them are independent. But really the qualitative conclusion that you should take away from this is that by combining symmetry and locality, there's a way to fix the K dependence of the wave function coefficients, not just in the boundary, but also in the bulk. Okay, so now we have a way of writing what the wave function looks like, as long as you don't cross the horizon, as an expansion in terms of just constant coefficients. Perfect, very good. And then these constant coefficients could be constrained using unitarity in the way that we've just described, because there's a conserved quantity that relates the initial state to the final state. Perfect. So my roadmap also doubles as my summary slide. And what we've seen today is that in this picture of inflation here, where you start in some initial state, you evolve according to some interaction Hamiltonian, which you don't know explicitly. What can you say about this evolution and the final fluctuations that are produced if you only know that it's the sitter invariant unitarity and local? And the answer is that if it's the sitter invariant, this implies bulk ward identities. So at any conformal time eta, you have some relation that mixes correlators of phi with correlators of the momentum pi. And in general, this depends on the functional form of these interactions. But there's a special place where you don't need to worry about the interactions, and that's when eta is zero. Okay? And this is, for instance, the result found by, by Daniel and collaborators in, in, in 2018 via the cosmological bootstrap. Now here we're saying that what unitarity does for you is provides a set of conserved quantities which let you connect properties of the initial state with this boundary state. And in particular, if you assume something like Bunch Davies in the past, then it would fix half of these constant coefficients in the cosmological bootstrap. Then the final thing is locality, and that's that a local interaction Hamiltonian Right? In this case, means it's just a polynomial, it's some analytic function in the momenta. And how do you see that simplicity, that mathematical simplicity? Well, what you need to do is introduce these transfer functions to express this bulk state in terms of the boundary state. 
And what that does is it gives you a neat way of extending whatever this final boundary state is into the bulk at the cost of just introducing a finite number of constant coefficients rather than a whole new complicated k dependence. So everything I've said was about really the scalar field on the sitter weakly coupled, so we ignored the loops. And so there's a few kind of obvious ways you might want to go beyond what I've told you today. Uh, the first thing is to go beyond a scalar field. Now that's just a, a kind of algebraic extension. You would want to put spin indices on the fields and then, and then repeat the exercise with the Schrodinger equation, et cetera. But this is of course very interesting if you want to go after the, the tensor modes that are also produced during inflation. The second thing you might want to go beyond is this uh, weakly coupled assumption focusing just on tree level. Um, and there you might hope to achieve something like a non-perturbative version of unitarity, like we know for flat space scattering amplitudes, that would be incredibly useful. Uh, and then finally, in light of the numerous you know, future surveys going after primordial non-Gaussianity, it would be very interesting to take these kind of consistency conditions that we have on the, the wave function during inflation and at the end of inflation and translate those into some catalog of allowed shapes that you would expect to see in the CMB if inflation were really a unitary and local dynamics. And now the final point, which I want to make, this is, should be the open question on everyone's lips. And that's that if we have all of these puzzle pieces, right? If we're starting to now understand how the space-time isometries and how unitarity and locality constrain the evolution of the wave function during inflation, is it possible to somehow put them together and, uh, and arrive at the kind of anal analogy of the powerful constraints that we've seen in the S matrix program for flat space scattering amplitudes. So thank you all very much for your attention uh, and I'll be happy to, to take any questions. I think I'll leave with the, the summary on the, on the screen. So thank you all very much. And um, maybe David, could you help me choose people to, uh, cause yeah, I don't know sure. if I can see who's raised their hands. Yes. Yeah, so, so thanks a lot, Scott, for a nice talk. So the first raised hand was uh, Ein Garens. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, hi, yeah. Hi, Scott. Thanks for a great talk. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask um, a question. So uh, obviously uh, a lot of stuff that, and I think this is relevant to Daniel's talk as well, but a lot of the stuff that you work with um, amongst Dave, amongst Davies initial condition. And mm -hmm. one thing I was just wondering is uh, that have you considered any other vacuum initial conditions? Because um, it has been shown, well, and going to be shown um, that you can distinguish between um, a different vacuum initial condition from a primary power spectrum, but it's specifically from like a classical approach that not really thinking about in terms of correlator language. Yeah, so good. Perfect. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's a really nice question. So particularly for this unitarity story, the idea here is that if you give me some initial state, it needn't be bunch Davies. It could have some you know, initial non-Gaussianity, some excitations on top. It could be some alpha vacuum. Then what you can do is compute these conserved quantities. Right? You compute them in the far past mm -hmm. from your initial state. And what unitarity guarantees is that these conserved quantities are the same if you were to compute them using your final boundary state. Okay, so there isn't anything here that's really intimately tied to assuming a bunch Davies or no excitations in the past. Good. So yeah, so that's a good question. Okay, so next I think was uh, Ashley, Ashley Wilkins. Hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that was a really interesting talk. Um, my question is also, I suppose in some way so follows on from that, it's, but it's about unitarity. Uh, the problem is if you start in a vacuum state that is um, like homogeneous everywhere, then you need to have some unit unitarity breaking process to then get spatial inhomogeneities. So, you know, if you're trying to then link these these correlators, you know, things you might see in a C and B or whatever, then unitarity can't be preserved all the way if you're going to start with something like the Bunch Davis vacuum. Um, so, is there a way for accounting for some sort? in you know you, you know some process at some point where you break unitarity and then you know then it's concerned for further evolution or something like that um in like what you do um because i'm just worried about like how legitimate this sort of calculation yeah. is 
Perfect. Sense. Yeah. Th thank you, Ashley. So, so I guess the, the safe answer to your question is that if you want some kind of unitarity breaking at some point during inflation, um, then that's okay. But of course, these quantities are no longer conserved. Um, if you then knew something about what state you wanted to end up in after the unitarity breaking had happened, then you could use that state to compute these conserved quantities, and that would constrain somehow the later uh, shapes you might see in the CMB. Um, the other, the other, I guess, this is just like a counter question, kind of reflects my ignorance rather than anything else. Um, here, I, I really did have in mind that uh, spatial translations were, were unbroken. So I have some unitary evolution that's generating, um, say, pairs of fluctuations. One has momentum k, the other one has momentum minus k. So that at the end of inflation, things are still um, statistically isotropic spatially. Right, even although particular fluctuations can have some momentum. So, so that, that maybe is just, uh, that's the kind of less, less safe response. You might say, oh, Scott, there's a really basic thing you've misunderstood about my question. But uh, that's, you know, I, I, I'm not sure whether you really do need some kind of unitarity breaking in order to get, you know, a pattern of fluctuations in the CMB. Well, because if you're, because if you're starting from a state which like, isn't like an eigenstate or something like your fluctuation operator, and then you just like squeeze it, then you need to in some way have some process which then like projects it onto that, which then would break unitarity. So I suppose you, if you can, you can start with something that is ever so slightly not, you know, you can start with very tiny fluctuations which you wouldn't observe and then it sort of evolve them unitarily. And then it's, so you might say oh, everything was almost perfectly modulus, but not exactly. But then I don't think you would could then be able to call that something like Bunch Davis mm -hmm. vacuum. Um, I think, yeah. Cool. If yeah, I okay. understand things slightly, but yeah. Perfect. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question. Okay, thanks, Ashley. So I think Enrico first and then Sadra. Um, thanks, Scott, for the nice talk. Um, well, I have a question or, or, or perhaps a comment or both about uh, spinning particles. And perhaps there is a little bit more than just uh, Algebraic, as far as your discussion of locality and an analyticity is concerned, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the most specific mm -hmm. thing that I'm worried about it is that when you have massless spinning particle, for example, uh, in the case at the hand that we're interested in for gravity, um, it is not true that local interaction corresponds to manifestly local terms in the Hamiltonian. As we know well, like from Maldacena's calculation, when you integrate out laps and shift, you get this inverse Laplacians. So I, I think that connection between the analyticity of these transfer functions mm. and locality, I think, would be lost when you have massless spinning particles. Yeah, fantastic. Great. So thank you so much for keeping me right and bringing that up. So very much what I had in mind when I said, oh, this is just some algebraic extension, is that um, for the we just heard in Daniel's talk that they have these amazing um, shifting operators that can change, say, the spins of the external legs. And so you can still do something like the, the space-time symmetry story. Uh, also for unitarity, um, you can still play exactly the same game with the Schrodinger equation now for your spinning fields and take differences like this. So you can still construct these conserved quantities. And so somehow that those parts of what I was saying, uh, I'm kind of confident that you can still make a good job of when you have spin. Uh, you're quite right that somehow the odd one out is this locality story at the end, because like you say, um, here I just had a scalar field and then it's very easy to say, oh, well, local interactions mean that the Hamiltonian is analytic in the momentum. And, uh, and I completely agree with you that if you have something uh, spinning that's interacting, especially it's massless as some gauge symmetry, uh, this, is, this is much less clear. And so somehow I guess the, immediately, we can say that some kind of you know manifest or apparent locality of the interaction, namely analyticity of the interactions, corresponds to analyticity of the transfer functions. But somehow, what you lose is then the obvious connection between analyticity and locality. That's then a lot more subtle. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Thanks. Okay, and uh, last but not least, Sadra before the break. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I just wanted to make a comment that it, it seems to me a roadblock when you want to extend this uh, conserved quantities uh, to non-Bunch-Davis vacuum, probably uh -huh. opposite to what you said. Uh, 
because the way you pictured it that uh, you have to find an analytical continuation such that you know the phi dagger of k bar equals phi k uh, uh, as as you as you said this actually doesn't have any solution except for a very i think a specific maybe boring uh non bosch davis vacuum which is just the al alpha vacuum with real alpha and beta mm -hmm. actually for generic k dependent alpha and beta which are maybe the most uh, physical ones mm -hmm. uh it is not guaranteed at all that such an extension so i mean uh, did you have something else in mind some other way to uh to probably make these conserved quantities useful in it. because I mean, uh, unless you can really relate everything to the boundary value uh, wave function coefficients, I mean, these are good. I mean, the, I mean, you're using the Schrodinger equation, the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian, but I mean, at the end of the day, the whole art of the bootstrap is that you can express everything in terms of the boundary correlate or not in terms of, you know, some integrated uh, over time quantities. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you can comment on that. Yeah. Thanks for a great talk. Anyway. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Sadhu. No, that's a, that's a really good question. I think for everyone's benefit, I'll also just say very explicitly that in um, in Sadhu's paper with Harry and, and Enrico on the cosmological bootstrap, they describe this analytic continuation uh, in, in in much more detail, much more carefully, and describe the branch cut of the mode functions, etc. That's definitely the place to look to understand what's going on with these k bars. Um, in regard to to your question in, in particular, so I guess what I had in mind really was that in the past, it's um, when I say non butch Davies, I had in mind some excitations so that initially maybe C3, C4, C5, et cetera, are non-zero, but that C2 is kind of the boring bunch Davies one, right? So that the mode functions still look like Hankel functions, i.e. in the past, they still look like E to the I, K, eta, so that you can deform your integration contour by some I epsilon and project onto the free vacuum. So, um, so there, when I had in mind, you know, states that were not bunch Davies in the past, I suppose I'm saying you still have the same kind of mode functions, but then the, the changes all come about uh, a higher order in this weak coupling where I add some small uh, initial non-Gaussianities and then let them evolve. Yeah, so, so that, that would be the, the answer to your question. If you have some more complicated C2 in the past, which is not the bunch Davies one, so that now your mode functions are some linear superposition of two different Hankel functions, uh, then, then I completely agree with you. It's much harder to find exactly what this k-bar should should be. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Sadhu. Okay, thanks a lot. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot to Scott and Daniel for two great talks. So now we have a 20-minute a break.